red button ends. <laughs> Uh, so welcome, uh, and uh, thank you all for being here today. This is a recorded event. I'm Anne Masoni, Dean of the School of the International Center of Photography. Welcome. I want to start by thanking the Society for Photographic Education, who we remain affiliated with and who has been generous enough to let us use their Zoom account. SPE is a member-based organization, for those of you who might not be familiar. We'll be dropping their website in the chat window momentarily. For those of you who might be new to Photofica, please do put your email address in the chat win window, but please direct it to me so that we can share um, with you any updates directly in addition to our social media posts. A few protocol reminders. Please do stay on mute while the presenters are um, giving their talk. We'll open the meeting up to the larger audience uh, once they've completed their presentation. Um, once we wrap up the presentations, please do feel free to stick around for that informal conversation. Please do use the uh, chat window for uh, Q&A. Um, the reason we like to do this is that it pro provides us the opportunity to um, follow up on any questions that may not get answered during the session and also gives us a chance to uh, facilitate for our guests. Um, and as I have said, um, oh wait, actually one more thing before I say that. I would be remiss because of the theme of today's talk to not mention that ICP is hosting a week long event called The Rules Are Broken. Um, and I'll be putting that link in the chat window. We do still have several days of programming ahead of us. So now um, we, as I have said every week, we are establishing the way we move forward in the shifting time. We can do this together. Over to you, John. All right, hey everybody, uh, I'm John Fryer. I teach at Virginia Commonwealth University and uh, I'm just gonna, you know, each week uh, I do some updates on kind of things that we've been working on. And um, so I'm gonna share my screen and, and give you some updates and then I'm gonna pass it to Betsy. Uh, I'm, re I'm really excited that we have uh, Kim Beal with us. Uh, I've been, in, we've been talking to her back and forth since the end of last year. So we're really excited to figure out a way to, to make this happen today. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and so I am, one of the things I wanted to show, uh, I am, I'm on the board of the Society for Photographic Education. And um, I've been mentioning this at, at, at previous PhotoFecus, but one of the things that happened uh, because of COVID is that we've adjusted what would have been our 2021 uh, conference and made it into uh, an entire year worth of programming. Um, so I just put a, I think I put, I'm gonna put this in the, in the chat so you can see it, but um, we had already gone through the process of doing the peer review for all of the panels that would have been part of this year's uh, SPE. And now all of those programs are spread out through the, the, this, this entire year. So on, to, on, on, on every other Tuesday, there's a, um, image maker presentation, uh, at least once a month, there's a panel presentation and all of those are listed here. And we've actually been making this fairly active in terms of uh, its uh, other events that are happening. So uh, I think uh, um, Anne just talked about the rules are broken. Uh, those that's listed there, there's, a, there's an upcoming uh, caucus exhibition. So, you know, it's a pretty lively and active event listing. So if you're looking for photo related things, uh, we're adding things to that. The other piece that's really important to us right now is that we are 25 days away from the end of our, um, our Kickstarter campaign. So uh, if you're just joining us, uh, one of the things that we did at the end of last year is we put a call out to uh, artists that were graduating in the class of 2020 with a BA, an AA, um, an MFA, an MA, anybody graduating in the class of 2020. Uh, more than 380 students submitted works, and then uh, more than 100, actually 134 uh, practitioners in the field, photographers and reviewers and critics, went through and, and selected a whole set of artists who then they wrote about, and we've created, and we're in the process of running a Kickstarter to build, um, we're pr producing 10 decks of these Photofica cards, and we are 40% funded, so we have 99 backers. So if you haven't backed us yet, 
uh, we need you to back us. So that's my, uh, that's my pitch. Uh, you should check them out because they're really, really fun. Um, and we're, uh, we're going to fund it by, we're going to fund it by hook or by crook. Is that right, Ann? I don't know how, Ann and Betsy and I will, will figure out a way if we have to sell, um, brownies, uh, I'll do it. But, but it would be so much better <laughs> if we didn't have to sell brownies because I have burnt everything I have ever baked and learned from my mother to inappropriately use olive oil when butter is suggested. So you don't want me to make brownies. That's right. That's right. So, um, so, uh, consider, I'll put that a link in the, in, in, and really, if you, you don't, we, we're, we, we are asking you to help us, but if you share it with other people, that would be extremely helpful because there might be people in your life that care about photography and or care about baseball because they're baseball cards, uh, if that wasn't clear. Um, all of our previous events are listed. So if you, all of our previous photo ficas are in an archive and this would be a thing just, just to mention that uh, we're essentially celebrating today uh, like the, the year long anniversary of, of the start of Photo Fica. So I think if I scroll all the way down to the bottom here, uh, where are we? What's the first video that we have? The first one was 318 uh, and this first video is 325. So uh, it's amazing that we, uh, I'm just amazed that we have been doing this for so long. So um, I think without further ado, the one thing that that um, I'm excited about is uh, one of the things that we, when we started doing Photo Fica uh, is we were responding to the needs of people uh, as they were making the, this transition to hybrid and digital teaching formats. And uh, our current guest is bringing back something that we, we started in the beginning, which was we set up a whole set of assignments so Kim actually created a new assignment for our assignment list that she's gonna talk about in addition to her research. So I'm really excited to have her and I'm gonna pass it to Betsy. Hi, so um, I wanna talk a little bit, I'm gonna introduce Kim in a minute, but I wanna talk a little bit about what John started to mention about this one year anniversary, which I think probably we've heard a lot of one year anniversary discussions going on um, it's hard to talk about almost anything without feeling like you're part of a, an echo chamber, like a, almost a worldwide echo chamber. Um, but then I think it is important to talk about these things. Um, I wanted, one of the things I wanted to start with was uh, the New Yorker from a couple weeks ago uh, ran some little blurbs from people a year after Pearl Harbor. And there's just this one I want to read. It says, some, some guy named... Herbert Clyde Lewis. And he said, after Pearl Harbor, like most other family men, I started fighting the war on the home front. I bought war bonds, became a blood donor, joined the air raid wardens. But then as the months dragged by, something happened to me, something that might be called patriotic dry rot. Slowly I began to lose my, as a home front fighter, lose my drive as a home front fighter Slowly, I began to indulge myself beyond all reason in expensive food and other luxuries and a desperate sort of merriment. The war began to seem remote. Um, I thought about, you know, there's, there's plenty of, of quotes similar. And I was remembering, you know, a year ago when we started Photofica and personally my own kind of energy and excitement. And, and I think, it's filled with adrenaline and, and I think fear. A lot of us were really like afraid, but there was also this sense of, of possibilities and excitement um, mixed in. And I think I've mentioned this before. I've been really, it's been really interesting to watch um, all of you, all of my students, myself, my kids, like how people have taken this on and ways in which people have grown and, um, but I think right now, probably the overriding feeling, at least I'm feeling is just like exhaustion and fatigue and kind of, um, it's hard to even think about, it's hard to assess right now. It's hard to, to kind of, uh, make the space. And I think all, all, because most of us are academics as well, like we've got like the last month of the semester, but I want to throw out some, some thoughts and some things that I think might be useful or something maybe even 
pleasurable, if that's possible. Um, but these ideas about um, what, what we've learned, I mean, that's a basic one, but what's been transformed um, and, you know, and especially relating to rules, um, which I, I, I hope is going to loop into to what Kim's going to talk about a little bit. But I think a lot of what we knew to be rules, whether it's how we taught or the structures, we had to decide which ones to break. We had to decide which ones to hold on to, which ones we were forced to let go of our own internal sense of, of how we were supposed to teach or how we were supposed to, to relate to the students. And I think that what's interesting now is sitting back and thinking about what, what happened, what were the benefits of, of trying to bend some of those rules or break some of those rules. Um, and and what have what have we created and established, or what are we creating and establishing in those places? Um, I feel like I encourage people to trust themselves in ways throughout the um, throughout this process of of like a sense of your intuitive um, or gut responses. Were, were were a lot of what we had to go on. I think. Oh, I'm talking about like we had to go on the olden days, but you know, thinking through like how our brains were working and how we solve these problems. And I, I read a quote and I cannot, I don't know who I should attribute to. I hope it's nobody in this audience, but somebody said also is uh, creatively dealing with limitations is what artists do. Um, so anyway, I just wanna, I wanna leave you with some of those thoughts to think about. And I, I'd love to keep having conversations about this and hearing from everyone about how, how you have um, been thinking about these things. And maybe this is a conversation again that needs to wait till the end of the semester because we are, I'm exhausted. Um, so anyway, that's just some, some random Betsy thoughts to, to start this off. But um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Kim Beale who teaches art history at Stanford University. Um, and is the author, I actually have your little bio here. Um, you've recently written about photography and climate change for the Atlantic, a prehistory a pre of Zoom backgrounds for Anne Psyche and pandemic bread photography for Literary Hub. Um, her book, Good Pictures, A History of Popular Photography was published in June, 2020. And we welcome, welcome you here, Kim. Thanks for coming. Great, thanks Betsy. Um, and thank you, John and Anne for the invitation for everybody for being here on yet another Zoom call. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen with you. So the assignment that I've given uh, or shared with all of you for you to give your students or to do yourself, um, it's called Good Pictures Breaks the Rules, and it's inspired by my recent book called Good Pictures. So in the book, I trace 50 stylistic trends through 175 years of photographic practice. Sorry, I'm just checking the chat here. Yeah, look, that's me. Um, so in these 175 years, um, I don't privilege any one kind of photographer over another. My primary goal was to create a history of photographs and visual styles that were widely seen. So it's neither strictly fine art nor vernacular photography, but it's all photographic. It's the stuff we see um, every day. In doing this research, though, I quickly realized that I couldn't rely on any single archive to discover what most people see or saw in any given time period, nor could I depend on a representative sample of photographs from this long period. So instead, I focused on guidebooks. And these books purport to determine what good pictures are or can be. And most of the photographic rules that appear in them seem so natural that they're thought of as nothing more than the techniques that result in good pictures. In fact, though, what we describe as a good picture is constantly changing. So as you can see in the proliferation of how-to manuals, this is just a very, very narrow um, scope of them. Um, so these cycles that define the trends are nearly as short-lived in the 19th century as they are today. The rules change, and sometimes the same style goes from a good picture to a bad one or vice versa in a very short period of time. So just thinking back to the early 2010s and the proliferation of the Valencia filter, it's like a time warp. 
So the rules for contemporary good pictures, such as the best angle for selfies, which is always this high angle, if you recall people walking around like this, um, or the best light for portraits, golden hour, all of those are in fact very recent adaptations. So in the next 20 minutes, I'm gonna walk you through the emergence of some of these trends or rules and then their downfall. So breaking the rules is an essential and even radical part of photographic practice. The celebrated rule breakers are often well-known photographers like Daido Moriyama, Jurgen Teller, or Richard Avedon, but the unsung heroes are just as often unnamed, anonymous, and even amateur photographers, whose rejection of the status quo has become a crucial part of our contemporary visual language. In 1912, Kodak began publishing a how-to series called How to Make Good Pictures. And the series ran through the 1990s. Not only did the books offer technical suggestions, but they also established many of the occasions for photographing that are still prevalent today. They recommended critical moments in heteronormative family life, from weddings and babies firsts to vacations, holidays, and casual pictures around the home. But despite the large number of women and people of color involved in photography since the medium's earliest days, the instructional literature was almost universally depicting white men photographers, photographing their smiling white wives and children. The 1972 manual in the middle of this picture is the first to include black subjects on the cover. As these books make clear, the rules about good pictures tell us a lot more than just what makes a good picture, but they also often tell us who was allowed to make one, at least according to the guidebooks. So one of the most important ways that folks have been breaking the rules all along is simply by being a photographer who looks different than the white men depicted in or writing these books. When new trends circulate, they often do so first among photographers, both amateurs and professionals. And only later are these rules admitted into the official industry standard how-to books. Many of these aesthetic changes are unauthored or their original uses are obscured. Sometimes they're pioneered by amateurs and seen casually by friends um, in slideshows or family albums. And sometimes they're just lucky accidents, which are then picked up as deliberate styles by professionals and art photographers. I think of this as the quintessential example of the intentional lucky accident by Friedlander. And another um, very influential example and perhaps even more pervasive where the photographers and techniques associated with the Japanese photo magazine Provoke founded in 1968. So the aesthetics of are bure boke, translated kind of generally as rough, grainy, blurry, and out of focus, were in direct conflict with the established rules of photography um, in the mid 20th century. Those rules demanded originally that photographs were highly detailed and sharply focused, that they were objective documents, much more than subjective descriptions of experience. Aesthetic rules and trends are named um, and eventually they end up in guidebooks, but their authorship still remains amorphous. They're gathered under the rubric of good pictures rather than the particular innovation of any one photographer. Even Instagram hashtags aren't always useful for identifying stylistic trends. Instead, hashtags often tend to focus on content rather than style. Um, as the Instagram account uh, Insta Repeat makes painfully obvious, uh, lifestyle brands and influencers in the outdoor industries create pictures that are remarkable um, for their homogeneity. This account uh, gathers pictures made by many different makers and then collages them together to show their similarity. So here you have uh, 12 photographs um, of different, mostly blonde haired women in red plaid jackets in a canoe. Um, and now this of course looks a lot like Taylor Swift's new album cover um, and the Photoshop landing page. Um, so this is all no accident. Um, this is a proven popular style. So it's very easy to see changes across generations of photographs, but aesthetic styles are rarely described during their initial moments of popularity. So for example, in the 1980s, the use of warm lighting for food close-ups um, was completely normalized and thought of as a good picture. But in the mid 2010s, we had exclusively a flat lay, you know, overhead shot and very cool lighting on Instagram. Both of these were considered the good pictures of their day, but they weren't ever discussed as a style during the period of their making. 
The change in photographic style is often attributed um, in history is to technological development. So major textbooks teach the history of photography, sometimes as, as simply a, as a history of technologies. So especially when describing 19th century photography, the mediums described, for example, by Beaumont Newhall or Helmut Grinsheim, as a history of what, photo, uh, what subjects were possible given the technological limits of the camera and chemistry. Sarkowski also focused on technology, everything from framing to flatness in the photographer's eye. So I'm gonna walk you through just one of these, which Newhall calls the conquest of motion. So these conventional histories show the medium progressing from those infuriatingly slow exposures of 30 minutes or more in the early years to improvements in chemistry that made it possible to record portraits um, without motion like you see here. And then they next celebrate the invention of dry plate technology, which eventually allows even amateurs to record fast motion, such as jumping or running. And Edward Mybridge's improved mechanical shutters developed in the late 1870s seem to be the apex of speed in the 19th century. But then Harold Edgerton comes along, pioneers the use of the electronic flash in the mid 1930s. I'm showing you here a chromogenic print made from in the 60s. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the history told this way, and I confess I'm even guilty of teaching it that way sometimes myself. But what became obvious to me in my research was that all along this timeline, there were moments of resistance to technological advances. After the widespread publication of Edgerton's photographs in 1930s um, and the increased availability of electronic flash um, coming onto the consumer market after World War II, there was a big back step that occurred. And I describe this as motion blur, which is the result of panning the camera to follow a moving subject. Um, you know, the technique is borrowed from filmmaking. The photographer chooses a slow shutter speed, which allows that background to blur while the moving subject remains sharply focused. So the panning trend surged in popularity in the late 50s and early 60s. And here you can even see that there's a fake blur added to the Dunlop logo in the background. So it, as if the um, owners of the track anticipated um, that photographers would be panning or that you would want to see a kind of blur with your eyes if you're a spectator in the stands. And here again, an illustration on the right uh, recreates the look of uh, panning motion blur. Um, and in the advertisement on the left, you can see um, the all over style of accidental blur on the top contrasted with that controlled motion blur on the bottom. So the use of motion blur at this time was justified as everything from a more natural way of perceiving motion to a fitting aesthetic for the cultural upheavals of the 60s. At the time, no one described motion blur as a response to the overly sharp still photographs enabled by consumer electronic flash. But I think that progression and that back step is actually quite important. Only when photographic technology overcomes a particular limit or a perceived failure are those accidental effects reintroduced for aesthetic gain. And this is when people start to break the rules intentionally. Like most trends though, the overwhelming popularity of motion blur led to a critical backlash in the 60s. Magazines debated the battle over blur and wondered whether it was a creative tool or a sloppy technique. Uh, there's enormous anxiety in photography over technique and the limits of artistic freedom. Most articles concluded like this one that it is quote, all too easy to blur a picture through sheer incompetence. Um, they insist that you must know what you're doing and break the rules with intention. And actually, um, although I, I say it in a funny voice, um, I, that's actually what I'm asking you to do in this art assignment too, to break the rules with intention. Uh, so this pattern of technological advancement followed by deliberate reintroduction of a former accident is something that I observed throughout the history of photography. A number of these trends appear in the 20th century, motion blur, of course, but also the intentional use of film grain and lens flare, but the pattern's not limited to the 20th century or the 21st century. Earlier trends such as soft focus and vignetting in the 19th century also represent a return to former failures for intentional aesthetic effect. So now I want to work backwards from some of the advice that is widespread today for taking good pictures. So it's clear to me that photographic style is passed on through visual experience and not just in published written how-to guides. 
But for the purposes of identifying established rules and recognized trends, these written sources are extremely helpful. With all the attention paid to selfies in the early 2010s, it comes as no surprise that advice proliferated for how to take a good selfie. One of the rules that always made these listicles was the avoidance of the low angle or the up the nose view as some people called it. Kim Kardashian even patiently explained her own selfie practice for Cosmo. And she said, quote, always take your selfie from above angling down. I think there's nothing worse than someone who wants to take a selfie and they take it from the angle down below and they get some double chin action. No one wants double chin action. Um, in 2010, OkCupid okay ranked more than 7,000 user photos according to pose and number of messages received from potential dates. And overwhelmingly, the pictures that received the most attention were photographed from high angles. OkCupid okay even removed the cleavage bearing shots from the sample and still found that users who posted high angle selfies received 50% more new monthly contacts than those who posted the second most popular pose, which were pictures taken in bed. So like most universals, the high angle view also turns out to be culturally and historically specific, no matter how ubiquitous the pose was on social media in the 2010s. As recently as the 1940s, low angle shots were considered preferable. At the time, just after color film became widely available, instructional literature bemoaned American photographers' ineptitude with the new colorful medium. The two chief offenses were color for color's sake and distracting colors in the background. So photographers suddenly had to learn to see the world in terms of hue and color contrast rather than just tonal values where light and shadow easily created separation between objects in black and white photography, contrasting colors had the tendency to stick out of an otherwise subdued background and collapse the appearance of depth. So this has the greatest impact on portrait photography as you all have no doubt seen um, in student work um, where it's necessary to separate that subject from the background. Um, so when you pose, um, as people did very often um, in mid-century, take the family outside, put them in front of a bush, in front of the house. Um, if that green bush has red flowers, um, the flowers seem to take on as much prominence as the subjects. So the solution to the problem of color contrast and these distracting backgrounds was very simple according to the guidebooks in the 1930s and 40s. It was simply to shoot everything against the sky. So more than half the portraits in um, a Kodachrome uh, how-to book make use of a low angle to frame their subjects against the blue sky. Um, and the author and pr principal photographer Ivan Dimitri explains that the greatest fault quote, uh, in the use of quote, Kodachrome by amateurs is that the photographer fails to approach his subject from the proper angle, end quote. So by turning the camera upwards, especially in combination with a polarizing filter, um, you get this beautiful blue background. Um, other books even explain that this angle gives the subject a psychological advantage, and they say that it makes a better picture. So the issue of camera angle and psychological advantage is often discussed in filmmaking, but it's less frequent in still photography. The dogma of the most flattering angle is really just a trend and it changes with the decades. Um, when I was right out of school and worked as a wedding photographer, I was taught to avoid low angles um, for portraits at all costs. Um, and as someone who's 5'5", five five, I actually had to carry a step stool with me to make sure that I always got those high angles. Um, so despite all of these, um, these rules um, about the preference for the high angle, it turns out that both the high and the low angle portraits are a matter of taste. As soon as I started looking, most of those supposedly unassailable rules in photography have undergone similar reversals. So I'm gonna conclude with another apparently ironclad rule that I learned in photo school and which I took to be a given. People look best at golden hour, the hour immediately following sunrise and preceding sunset. So I was shocked to discover in the course of my research that for most of the 20th century, golden hour simply did not exist. And that's not to say that the sun ceased to rise and fall, rather that amateur photographers were advised to avoid the warm low angle light associated with sunset and sunrise. 
Only when that dramatic quality of light became recognized as a desirable aesthetic in the mid 1990s did the phrase golden hour achieve prominence in the how-to literature. So exposure guidelines were included in every box of Kodachrome since its debut in 1936. However, these printed charts only guaranteed accuracy for pictures taken more than one hour after sunrise or one hour before sunset. They were warning otherwise of the reddish or orange glow that would be cast on the film. And some guidebooks allowed that that color, the orange or red glow could be a positive feature when representing landscapes, but they also said that it was unsuitable for portraits. Um, one author explained, quote, just before the sunset, uh, the color of the light is markedly red. It is only natural that pictures made at that time sometimes appear abnormally colored and avoid the difficulty by making your color pictures of people earlier than two hours before sunset. So the pejorative language used by guidebooks to describe these effects of photographing people in warm light also, to my mind, underlines the apparent threat that these pictures posed. For more than a century, photographic guidebooks, as well as the camera and film industry at large, assumed that their customers were predominantly, if not entirely, white. So visualizing those assumptions, most guidebooks featured white models taking pictures of other white models in middle-class domestic spaces. When authors described the effects of golden hour on skin tones, they meant white skin, which had been used as the benchmark for accurate exposure by camera and film manufacturers since the medium's invention, as you can read um, in detail in Lorna Roth's study or um, an essay by Sarah Elizabeth Lewis. Although photographs of white models taken in golden hour light occasionally appeared in fashion magazines during the 1970s and 80s, those pictures were limited to summertime subjects or advertisements for sunglasses and sunscreen. It's not uncommon, though, during the same period to see golden hour used by travel, travel photographers and National Geographic photographers to depict people of color. Almost never was it applied to people with white skin. Here are a couple examples of those summertime subjects from the 1980s in Vogue. But then by the 1990s, golden hour starts to become accepted um, within other frames of reference and on, used on other kinds of skin. So fashion and advertising photographers began applying the golden glow to street scenes and other outdoor photo shoots involving white models. Um, by the mid 90s, the photographic literature was also reflecting that major shift. So quite suddenly, the photographer's working times were um, entirely inverted. Now the midday hours from 10 a.m. till 4 p.m. were useless. As popular photography advised in 1997, quote, the quality of light during the last hour before sunset is better than the rest of the day put together. Avoid it at your peril. So the phrase golden hour appeared regularly in all manner of periodicals from local newspaper articles on how to take summer snapshots to advice columns of specialist photography publications. So nearly every one of those articles took the time to point out that the phrase golden hour was borrowed from filmmaking or professional photography. And the application of the moniker golden hour didn't occur until the effect was celebrated, which kind of gave it the aura of a trade secret. Whereas just 10 years earlier, it was still common to rec uh, recommend the use of filters to balance out the golden light of the evening, especially in portraiture. By 1995, the orange sherbet colored warming filters and even those warm based films became standard equipment in any photographer's bag. So cultural as well as technological changes contribute to this change in photographic technique or photographic rules. While black models appeared on runways and in high fashion advertising during the 1970s and 80s, they were rarely cast in advertising by mainstream ready to wear brands until the mid 1980s, when the international clothing brand Benetton introduced the United Colors campaign. Picturing models of many skin tones in the same advertisement, Benetton's stated concern was with promoting a standard of beauty that celebrated plurality. At the same time, these advertisements and their appearance in print demanded film and printing technology that could accommodate all skin tones, no longer favoring only the idealized light beige or pink tones that had for so long determined film standards. 
It wasn't until commercial advertising accounts complained about films inadequate representation of brown tones in their products that research was undertaken to produce a more brown sensitive film stock. Very Color 3 and the popular Kodak amateur film Gold Max, both released in the 1980s, were noted for their improved rendition of brown tones and their overall expanded dynamic range. So all of these so-called good pictures are tightly bound up with cultural prescriptions. Even when such judgments are silent, their influence can be felt in the ardor with which our critics argue for one mode of pic picture making over another. Acceptance of photographic effects such as golden hour or high angle or distracting colors in portraiture requires much more than simply learning how to anticipate film's objective rendering of the subject, but also it requires that the photographer learn how to think of those subjects and themselves in more nuanced ways. There's no universally good picture, only the picture that appeals to its viewers at a given cultural moment. So good pictures often break the existing rules. They reject the hegemony of commercial rules and in so doing, they make space for new aesthetics and new audiences. So no matter what the rule books say, the rules are always changing. So I invite you to submit your own pictures or ask your students to submit some good pictures that break the rules to our Instagram hashtag. Um, so I would love to answer some questions or discuss these rules and the creative breaking of them. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. That's, I'm, I'm really excited about all these like different, different directions that, that, that this can go in. Um, and I invite anyone to ask a question. I have a question though. I want to start out with is you mentioned very early on, um, about, uh, profile photos um, in OkCupid okay, or, um, and I'm wondering if you've done much uh, research about that. And uh, as someone who actually is advising my young adult children how to make profile photos, one thing I'm finding is that the advice that I'm giving them that I know um, isn't, they're not taking it. They don't, they don't think it's right. And I'm, so I'm wondering um, just if you've had any, any thoughts, even like right now, how profile photos for dating sites are working. Is there a code right now for that? I haven't done more contemporary research um, more than the OkCupid okay sample from the 2010s. Um, but I can tell you one of the things that I think is super fascinating about profile photos um, is the in occasional um, auto rotate that some of my students prefer to have a like um, horizontally <laughs> rotated photo of themselves like this, um, which I think is a way of rejecting Facebook's status quo. They say like, I mean, it's, it's an F you to Facebook. I'm not gonna do what you tell me to do. Um, so I love the ways that people can, you know, try to break the algorithm. <laughs> That's the one more thing, and then we have a question. I also, the thing I hate and I will never like was the tongue thing. I hope that's over. Like the, the, the photo with the tongue, my stepdaughter does it all the time. And I'm like, there's no planet that that's okay. But you know, your point about rule breaking is really interesting there. Um, let's see, this is Martin's question. Um, which artists do you consider that are were working with the fo with photo mistakes? So some specific. Yeah, Martin, do you want to come in? Maybe not. Do you have any specific artists that you can talk about? Yeah. Um, so we've included a few of them on the assignment page, um, and I can walk you through a few of them. So I think um, certainly Dido Moriyama comes to mind immediately for using film grain intentionally. Um, so pushing film, um, increasing the graininess of it, underexposing, using Tri-X. I mean, it's interesting because at that time in the 1950s, this is when you suddenly got amateur films with a pretty fine grain. And again, it's one of those moments where photographers say, you know what, we don't want it to be so perfect as you're telling us to make it. 
Um, so you see that happening um, with the Provoke photographers. I've also got some examples of Robert Heineken making some beautifully grainy photographs intentionally at the same time. Um, some of the other photographers that I'm thinking of, um, one that comes immediately to mind is Roy de Carava, who I don't think would have considered his photographs. Um, I, I think he would have thought of them as breaking the rules because they are so dark. Um, they have this incredible velvet, um, very low key uh, lighting situation and printing. Um, so I do think he was intentionally breaking the rules. Um, we've got an example on um, man in a window. Um, I also think of the beautiful table scene, the ketchup bottle. Um, others um, more recently were thinking about um, Paul Mapagi Sequoia, who I believe Anne recommended um, for including his lens in the frame. Um, and so certainly a nod to um, mirror selfies and including your phone in the frame. You know, there's no um, attempt to get the phone out of the frame if you're doing something like this. Um, and I think, you know, that's another way of commenting on agency and control within the photograph, um, recognizing that you are making the picture as, um, and you are representing yourself at the same time. Um, and that seems to be a rule that's also been broken. Um, one of my favorite uh, artworks, which I hesitate to call a photograph, is uh, John Baldessari's Wrong, uh, where he restages many of these rules from a historic how-to book. And so the wrong picture shows him with a palm tree growing out of his head. Um, so that's um, a few of my favorites. Also Rinko Kawauchi, um, who's got these wonderful, um, lens flares and overexposures, which contribute to the sense of um, authenticity in her work, makes it feel like a, a kind of a contemporary snapshot aesthetic. Yeah, so um, yeah. thanks, Martin. Um, nice to have you here. And do you want me to just keep going through some of these questions? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, the next one, Scott, Scott has a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, if you want to read it. Thanks. This is a wonderful question. Um, I do have a chapter on bokeh and it's kind of uh, repopularization um, in the US, which I would kind of point to Flickr in the early 2000s um, after its initial use among um, the Japanese provoke photographers. Um, it was one of the things I think in the 2000s that indicated that you're working with a 35 millimeter camera. Um, and so it was a way of separating out um, a, an amateur from like what became a prosumer. Um, but I love this, this secondary element here about the tilt shift aesthetic, um, because as you probably all remember um, and know that that's a filter that you can add to your photos now and have been able to do so on smartphones for at least the past 10 years. Um, and I happen to notice it in the Super Bowl uh, this year that they were, it seemed like a weird use of video tilt shift, which doesn't even exist, but I think it was such a popular style that um, the videographers um, at the Super Bowl, in order to make it look like new, because there were no fans in the stand, we could do something different. Um, I noticed a tilt shift aesthetic there. We can we can argue that out in the comments. <laughs> well, it's funny because you you saying that triggers me as a view camera photographer, but also someone who thinks she breaks the rules all the time. Because it's it's on one hand, I'm like tilt shift is a thing. I do it all the time, not on purpose with my view camera, right? But that idea that. Um, the rules, you said something about anxiety over tremendous anxiety over technique. Um, and I could feel it inside myself as a teacher, getting to be older and someone I thought that I was a rule breaker. And now I realize I might be a rule enforcer. And a lot of, a lot of popular photography of filters of, of, of digital technology is threatening in ways that, that, um, it's really interesting. And I, I guess I, I just wanted to, to call out that, that quote that you said about anxiety, technology, and aesthetics. Um, it's, it's, I mean, I think I've always known that, but to articulate it, that, that's really important. And it really, for me, affects how I teach. Um, I mean, I, I can see that that's a 
plays a strong element into how I explain rules to students. And then I'm explaining why these rules are there. And then as I'm explaining them, I often realize like I'm passing on a tradition and it, it's good in some ways and in other ways it's bad. And that I, I feel that anxiety, right? So. Um, well, so I can speak to that and also as an art historian um, and as an art critic, you know, when I go to a gallery and I'm reviewing a show, I'm interested in whether the, folk, the the artwork speaks to me, but also like, is the artwork speaking and making accidents for no apparent reason it doesn't always make something that's compelling visually. And so you, I think there needs to be an awareness of why you're doing what you're doing, whether that's upholding the rules or whether it's breaking them. Um, and I appreciate work that falls into both camps. Um, just this morning, I was in a lecture in which the lecturer mentioned the rule of thirds and how um, uh, Wes Anderson is very well known within um, filmmaking for breaking the rules. He always puts his subjects dead center and there's a ton of symmetry. Um, and I think that's something that we've seen in the post Instagram age when you're working with squares, it was, again, one of the things that people didn't like about square photography. We weren't supposed to make squares because they're a tensionless shape. Um, so yeah, there are lots of ways that you can play with rules, but I think unless you know the rules, you're not playing with them. We have another, oh yeah, so this okay. that's my response also to you, Karen. I like this comment too, that um, it's an anti-compositional move, putting people in the middle of the frame. So I have I have a course that's called Photography is Magic. That's a photo for non-majors, right? And and you know one of the things that you know they all come in interested in photography and have 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 you know they're they're not trained in photography, but they obviously taken lots of photographs and they they take a lot of advice from Visco and their Kardashians and and all of that. Like they're and and even our even our majors even our major students, they almost have dual lives where they've got this Instagram presence where they're, they're keeping up with the audience that's paying attention to them in certain ways. So, you know, somebody who's making a whole series of portraits about, about family and then their, their side hustle essentially is all these makeup photographs that fit within the makeup, uh, you know, Instagram space. So I'm wondering about this because you're talking about the pendulum of of the way photographs, popular photographs kind of shift from, from one thing to another, you know, in the digital space, like it's gotta be app connected and filter connected and, and it, it has to shift much more quickly, right? So like, you know, like one, one thing that was popular, be it, be it fake tilt shift uh, six months ago uh, might be so six months ago. <laughs> yeah, you know, I agree. I love this quote too, um, that they have dual lives. Um, and I think we have dual lives as viewers of photographs as well, that something that looks good advertising an In-N-Out burger doesn't look good on a makeup tutorial and, and you wouldn't want to see it in the New York Times. Like there are ways that, um, you know, our, we expect different types of media treatments um, for different subjects and in different locations. Um, and to speak to the, the speed of these transitions, I know it seems like it should be faster, but I don't think it is. Um, even in the 19th century, I think one of my favorite examples is the rise of the Rembrandt effect. Um, so before that, people did just what we're all doing here is we like stare at the screen. We have a very evenly lit um, face. There's no shadows falling across it. And then all of a sudden in 1868, you have William Kurtz who comes along and says, you know what, I wanna add some lighting and some depth um, and shadows. And I, that, it was popular for a while. Um, it was popular for maybe two years uh, until everyone felt like every picture was using the Rembrandt effect. It didn't have the, um, it didn't have the power that it did immediately. So that's like a two year turnaround in the 19th century when people were only seeing photographs by either visiting the photographic studio or looking at their friends' pictures. Um, and it's pretty startling, but I do think that the trend turnovers still happen then. Maybe we have more trends now <laughs> than we did then, uh, but there was still a pretty rapid turnover. 
So I am our reminder of a hard stop at five o'clock. Uh, <laughs> uh, Alex, I see that your hand is up. Um, uh, so is that a, a prompt for a question? Yeah, just real quick. I think one thing that leaps to my mind is that um, I think historically there was kind of an art world and a mainstream world. And I remember being in graduate school, making some video work that was decidedly mainstream because the technology had gotten really good and all my art school compatriots were like, you can't do that. It's like, looks too, it looks too good. You know, we still want like, you know, Bill Viola or Bill Viola was sort of the bridge maybe. But the point being, I think now there's students are crossing into or are blending these spaces. The, the mainstream world and the art world are really, really cohabitating in the same people in a way that I feel like wasn't true 20 or 30 years ago. Maybe my anecdotal experience, so I don't want a blanket statement, but I'm just curious um, if that plays into your research at all, Kim, or if anything that you've seen around that, that um, anyway, I'll stop rambling because we're short on time, but. <laughs> no, that's a great question. I love that. Um, and yeah, I can totally imagine uh, the art students rejecting things uh, for their, their perfection. Um, and it's interesting, even if there were photographers who were working in commercial spaces, the galleries made a real effort to separate that work out. So I'm thinking about Larry Sultan, for example, who did advertising campaigns as well as editorial work. Um, but I didn't know about that until about 10 years ago. Um, and I think that's because I came to Larry Sultan's work through galleries and museums and I didn't get to see that other work. Um, and so those things seem to be like part of the commercial interests of, of separating out these different worlds. Um, but I also think back to a photographer like Richard Avedon, and I just read Philip Gefter's wonderful biography. Um, he, Avedon had a really hard time getting his work into museums uh, because he was tainted by the commercial world because people didn't take him seriously. He was too polished. Uh, he seemed like a one trick pony and they were uninterested for a really long time, even though he absolutely changed the landscape of American photography. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, um, it's really a hard place to be in when you want to lead those dual lives. And in fact, many of us do. And I think what maybe our students are learning more quickly is how to navigate between those two spaces. I think I, one thing to add into that, though, too, that I'm struck by is the necessity to ex, to explain, even for me, more important in understanding the rules is understanding how the rules are functioning. And I, I, that's a, a somewhat might seem like a not a very strong distinction. But I do think that when, you know, like Alex, like why thinking through why, why sometimes is the language of advertising distinctly different from the la language of art. And I, I, we don't have time to go into this, but I feel like the politics of aesthetics is also, and the politics of rules and who makes what rules and why and when. And I don't think we throw away all of them, hence my own tension, but which, you know, so a layer beyond what are the rules is why are those rules there? And I think when you talked about the golden hour, you've talked about several things that were really interesting and some rules you're like, eh, that's a really bad reason. And some rules you're like, oh, that's about, that's about physics. That's about uh, emotional response. That's about like other things. So um, I find that kind of a fascinating dimension to it as well. Yeah, you're right. Rules are made uh, you know, to keep people out. Um, and I think one of the things that's maybe dangerous about the crossover and the way that commercial interests pick up these um, avant-garde aesthetics uh, is because they make us trust things as um, coming from a place of authenticity rather than a place of market research um, and manipulation. Um, that if we see a snapshot aesthetic um, used in an advertising campaign on Instagram, it seems like it's made by a single person and not by a corporation who's trying to influence you. So I think that's probably some of the fear about um, using, going to commercial accounts to um, look for your aesthetic impulses um, because they mean different things when they're used in those spaces. Right. Okay, lots of other questions. 
Uh, we've, we've got mostly people beginning to uh, thank um, you and I'm gonna go ahead and do the same. Um, uh, Kim, thank you so much for being here with us today. We really appreciate your research, your insight, um, uh, you know, uh, putting questions to us and having us, uh, you know, reconsider um, those rules and, and why. And, and so thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you so much. Where's so the much. assignment posted? It's, Are we gonna? <laughs> Yeah, so the assignment is posted on Photofica. I've sent links to it a few times and I'll send it to you right now. So everything that we've talked about there uh, is there again. Um, let me see where everybody is. Yeah, uh, so yeah, thanks Kim so much for, for making the time to come and hang out with us and share your research. I was, I was, um, I was thinking about computational photography recently because I, I had an abstraction assignment for these for these photos for non-majors and uh, there were no like the the shadows had had lots of detail and the whites had lots of detail and I was like oh that's because uh, that's because HDR is by default turned on so you're never going to get a sharp dark black on anything that if you're using the default setting so and that also has you know those are rules that are baked into the machine itself uh, and also AI sorting, all of that stuff is, you know, so th those, those Kodak books and their, and their prejudices are, you know, being digested by AI uh, and they're being fed back to us, which is why there's, you know, 27 pictures of, of the blonde haired girl, uh, you know, paddling her canoe. Yep. Yes. So much to say about computational photography. I will leave it for another time. All right. Yeah, sounds, thank like a, you. sounds like another book. Yeah, thank yeah. thank you. So much more to talk about. Thanks All right, everybody. Make sure make sure you you share our uh, our, our 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 Kickstarter so that we can make these things. Please, please, please. I feel like we're Thanks begging. Everyone. Have a good rest of your week. Bye. Yeah, have a great week, everybody.